Welcome in, everyone. This is another edition of the Full Time Roundup Podcast. It is your host, Daniel Brackett. Joined alongside me, Harrison Clark. Harrison, it was a good weekend of sports. A wild college football weekend. Some good NFL. And then, of course, the soccer. The soccer was glorious. Charlotte SC played their last home game of the season. We will have a play-in match at Bank of America. I'm looking forward to that. Just locked in tickets when we host. But, my friend, how are you doing? I'm doing well. It was a good soccer weekend. Thought of the games in general were a lot of fun to watch. I mean, you, know, you mentioned the CLT boys. I mean, Patrick Ajimong is him. I yeah. like that guy way too much a little bit right now. But uh, other than that, the quality sports weekend, and you know, I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, I'm pretty pumped. Charlotte FC and uh, UNC Charlotte winning their respective games on the same day. How about those it's, Niners? It's a fantastic feeling. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing my Niner green as we speak. Still, still happy uh, from you know my sports teams just ignoring the Panthers as that was pathetic. But you know, it's the most pathetic franchise we have. So can't really get mad at uh, calling a spade a spade. But Um, We're going to keep it pretty tight here um, just because, you know, it is international break. And, um, you know, quite frankly, I'm I'm pretty upset about it. The the Champions League, Europa League, Europa Conference League, midweek matches have honestly just made the weeks go by so quickly, especially, you know, it's a a month or what, Tuesday through Thursday, you have games all like literally from noon all the way through five. So, you know, you know, I do work hard, but it's nice. Like when I'm watching a game during the quick breaks, it just makes the day go by fast. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a battle this week, I think for me and, and, you know, <laughs> definitely next week as well. Um, but to kind of jump into it, the premier league, um, we've, we've sort of touched on this before, but, Manchester City, Arsenal, and Liverpool all all won the the three contenders. You could probably say for the Premier League title, but not none of these teams are are winning that convincingly. So I wanted to go through each of their results and then kind of talk about other state of the Premier League. But starting with Manchester City because they're probably the the bookies' favorites uh, at this point. They they had a really tough game against Fulham here. Um, they won three, two, which is a very uncharacteristic game for Manchester city, but this Fulham team were finding holes all over this, all over this team. And, uh, to be honest, I think Fulham could be probably a little bit upset. They didn't at least get a tie here, um, on another day being more clinical, they probably could have won this match outright. No question. I mean, I'm thinking about. I mean, if Adama Traore could just find a way to put to the finish, ball in the back of net, it's nuts. I mean, the guy would arguably be one of the most lethal players in the world. Like, you put together his speed, his size, and if he just had more finishing ability, this guy would be unbelievable. Um, and he had a chance one-on-one with Ederson in the first half that Ederson saved. He had another chance right in front of the net, I believe, either late in the first or in the second half. They put over the bar. Um Fulham played a great game, and they were hitting on transition a lot through Triore, putting it in, in behind, letting him run after it because, you know, nobody's going to catch him. I mean, they had – there was one moment, I think, in the second half where it was it was Triore and Kyle Walker one-on-one, and he dusted him. And I was like, holy cow. Like, is Walker actually, like, washed now, or is Adama just him? But um, Fulham had great chances. I mean, I think about the Pereira goal, the first goal that – Back heel flick from Raul. From Stop Raul. it. He might be back, actually. Raul he is Mendes. back. He uh he is back. He he had a couple off years the past couple. I know he's been affected by injury a good amount, but he's uh he started to really pick it up for this Fulham team and frankly taking the taking the place of a uh, Rodrigo Munez who was un, unreal to end the year last year. So that's big ups to him. But Fulham had their chances, no question, but it just shows you that Man City 
I mean, they just find ways to win, and nobody can really seem to solve that formula right now. They get two goals from Mateo Kovacic. Like, sure, yeah. Uh, Not Rodri, but Mateo is stepping up in a, in a big way in that in that city midfield. No question. And you know, if Holland's not the one putting the balls in the back of that right now, you need to find somebody else to do it. And um, Kovacic is definitely doing that. Um, and then Doku hit an absolute banger to 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 finish it off. So, I mean, that goal was nasty. <laughs> Duck you! <laughs> I, I love, I that thing was that thing was name. dipping and swerving and uh it Leno. Leno had yeah. no idea what that ball was doing in the air. But yeah. again, City just find ways to win despite Fulham, I think, playing a really solid game. And Fulham shouldn't be upset. I don't or, or they should be upset probably that they weren't able to finish, but they shouldn't be upset with the kind of performance that they put in against one of the best teams in the world. Yeah. I would say like Friday night, I was kind of looking at the slate, just kind of deciding, you know, what games I wanted to watch, what games I didn't. And then I had like some innate feeling. I was like looking at the table because I feel like we, we, me and you especially, we, we go through and really talk about that weekend's results. But there are times where I'll go and look at the table and be like, oh my God, like I can't believe, you know, with the, a more zoomed out view, this team is here. And, and this Fulham team, is is eighth right now after this result i think they were higher before and you know their results have been phenomenal i think we mentioned how you know so marco silva's done a fantastic job over there but i had some innate feeling that they'd show up to this one and i, I was like maybe it's head-to-head -head record i've seen this before not the case city usually blows the doors off of fulham i just had a feeling and then you know the game opens and and Fulham has the first like really good three opportunities and of course City just does the inevitable but yeah no I I was very impressed with this team Adama Traore is probably the best athlete in the Premier League no questions asked I mean Walker is definitely getting up there in age and you know that's pretty apparent but he still keeps up with most players these days I feel like and but I even mean, Adama's not that old like or isn't that young anymore like. He's yeah, still I mean, relative. I don't even know their ages, but I'm um, Adama's 28. Walker's okay. like in his thirties, but I mean, yeah. Adama also, I mean, you just have to look at the guy, the oh. guy, the guy is insanely jacked. When he, oils the, when he oils the arms up. Yeah. yeah I mean, Cause people literally have, that's the only advantage of like keeping up with him is just grabbing onto him. So he'll mm -hmm. literally get himself slippery. So people can't keep up, but I mean, the guy's nuts. I mean, he, he came from La Masia. He's, yeah. you know, for the last, what, eight eight to ten years, you know, everyone knows who Adama Traore is because he always had the raw athleticism. It was if he could put everything else together. People are, have still been asking that question for the last decade because it still hasn't happened. And I don't think it will ever happen at this point. But he's starting in this Fulham team, and he's making a difference. So maybe, you know, a couple really good games will get him rolling, and we can look back at this, you know, clip here and be like, okay, well, maybe we were wrong. But uh, you know, that's the first game I wanted to talk about. City just don't they don't look as good as they usually are, which is gonna be a really fun Premier League race continually. I mean, that's I think we're already see starting to see signs, especially from Vegas, that Arsenal have now become the favorite to win the title. Have they? Officially by betting odds. Um, and I think I'll I think a large portion of that is because Rodri is so important to that team. You you take him yeah. out, and even though Kovacic scores two, you think about long term if he's able to fill that kind of void. It remains to be seen. And with Arsenal's undefeated start, I guess part of me isn't really that surprised. Yeah, let's talk about Arsenal. I mean, I've seen cracks in the foundation as well. Here, this is you know the second game in a row where they played uh, an inferior opponent. You know, they played Leicester last week and they played Southampton two arguably relegation sides struggled tremendously. It was zero, zero at half. Of course, Southampton score the first goal and then Arsenal start to sweat, start to try really hard. And they end up scoring three goals, kind of like how they were against Leicester where they won four, two, but Leicester made it super interesting. Obviously, you know, be proud of the result. Be proud of the character. You know, they had a big match against PSG midweek, blah, blah, blah. But this is a very unsustainable way to play. If you play a better team and do this, you will probably lose the game or draw. 
Um, they're just lucky they've done this against two really bad teams. Um, and I think they miss Odegaard a lot. They uh-huh. they had plenty of chances in this one. It wasn't a lack of performance. It was just not putting the ball in the back of the net. You know, you'll never get me to back Arsenal to win a Premier League because they have Kai Havertz and Gabriel Jesus leading the line with Martinelli on the left. Those guys just are not elite, in my opinion, and they never will be. So, you know, starting four center backs and not conceding any goals, you know, will, you know, take you far. I just don't think it'll take you to a Premier League title. Yeah, I mean, uh... Odegaard just drives so much play going forward that you can see when he's not in there and you're starting Rice, who isn't really com- as comfortable going forward, and you're starting Jorginho, that it's like you don't get that kind of um, offensive explosion that you're probably capable of with Odegaard in there. Um, Got to give credit to Saka. He played a hell of a game, goal and two assists. I mean, with no right. Odegaard, you need him. You mm-hmm. you need him to be the driver of the offense. Um, like you mentioned, I, I don't think that Havertz or Jesus are elite by any means, but also at the same time, like Kai scores kind of when it matters most sometimes, which is strange. I mean, I anytime I think of Kai, obviously I think of him for his Champions League goal and, and the joy he brought me at Chelsea for that moment alone. But a lot of times it feels like, and we saw it in the Euros too, that he backed some goals there that – he finds ways to get involved when they need him the most. And you just kind of wish that he would turn up for, you know, larger stretches of the game. Um, but he gets his goal to at least tie it because Southampton had taken the lead early in the second half and we didn't know what the hell was going on. So, um, I mean, that goal probably did inject some sort of life into them because obviously they couldn't find anything before that. Um, and the, the way that they were able to b- battle back is encouraging still some signs that, you know, there's a lot to improve on and, how they're going to fill Odegaard's hole, but they're still undefeated. And I guess at, at this point, it's wow. Yeah, no, absolutely. I wasn't very impressed with Sterling either. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe that'll take time. Maybe that'll I just don't know. Time. I don't know what Arsenal fans are ex- exactly expecting from him. I don't know what I expect from Sterling anymore. I mean, I feel like he's been in the Premier League for so long. He's done so well at most clubs uh, he's also been playing for a very long time i mean i think he was in the liverpool starting xi at 18 and then played and was one of the best players for manchester city for for five years after he he, he made that move so you know this this his chelsea stint in this stint is probably on on the downturn i think he will drop off quicker than most do um so once the 31 32 I think he'll be, you know, he won't definitely won't be the same player he was, but I mean, he's still 29. He hasn't even hit 30 yet. So you you would, it is wild to think about, but you would expect a little bit more from a player and he had chances. He just classic Sterling stuff. So I don't know, maybe he'll step up his game when, when Arsenal need it most during this long season It is a long season. We're only seven, seven games in. Um, But I did want to at least touch on that. Now, um, I'm not going to really talk too much about this Liverpool game just because I, I don't really think there's much to talk about other than Jota could have probably had a hat trick in the first half. He did score um, the goal and Cody Gakpo got the assist, which you know I'm, I'm a gigantic fan of Cody Gakpo. So every time he comes in, I expect him to do something uh, really well. Um, I was very happy with Jones, Curtis Jones as well, stepping in for Dominic Schobersly. Um I mean, I, I I just love our midfield and our, our front. I mean, I love our whole team, to be honest. But grabbing Barrick McAllister with whoever else you want in there as the attacking mid is just so dominant in, in the Premier League. And then, you know, Salah still rolling back the years here. He'll have a stinker every once in a while. But you know, when you need him most, he's going to step up with the big goal. I do have one issue, though, and... I'm starting to understand why Liverpool is signing uh, Mar- I don't even know how to pronounce the guy's name, the Georgian goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Um, Allison might be the most injury prone goalkeeper I've ever met. I mean, I know this is not a betting show. This is a soccer show, but I did have a financial interest on Liverpool 
and Queen Kelleher was not in the squad. So we tried out that third string keeper who hasn't played in forever. Never played in the Premier League before. Hey, and great save. Yeah, he did. And I was very nervous. And so Queen is going to, you know, probably be the goalkeeper again for for the next couple of weeks after the international break. But, I mean, Allison, you're a goalkeeper, dude. You cannot be pulling your hamstring like that. That is crazy. It was It was a pretty funny tweet. It was like the video or the picture of the guy. It's like, I'm not the father, I'm the stepfather or whatever. And it's like Queen Kelleher this year because <laughs> I feel like he has stepped in the last like five seasons, at least one one month of the of the season and has just like been incredible. So thank God we have a really good backup keeper or Liverpool would be in trouble. Yeah, I mean, Allison missed 10 games in the Prem last year because of injury. Um, and, you know, I don't know the exact status of his in, this injury this time around, but it does seem that he recently has has been pretty injury prone, and it's a good thing for Liverpool that Kelleher is there because I think he's a very quality backup. I mean, I get nightmares thinking about the Cup final against them, but yeah, I think Slot he just has some tough decisions. I think with who he wants to start some games, like Gakpo. Mm-hmm. The Gakpo this year has been. Very good, off yeah. The bench in particular, um, and Luis Diaz has been one of their main contributors as well. And you're probably and you're not going to bench Mo, so I think that it's kind of in a tough, it's a tough situation. I think especially for Gakpo because I think Diaz is the favorite. Um, yeah. But you know you can't be mad, or he can't be mad with his performances, and it's all in the coach's hands. I mean, he had an unreal Euros too, like arguably the best player at the Euros. Yeah. And, still can't get into this Liverpool team. I mean, it's probably, it's a tough, it's a tough situation. I think for slot to handle it is. And it's a completely different look tactically to Diaz. will just like, he's like more over the top, more like electric mm-hmm. Gakpo is just, you know, he's just so technically sound that he just makes things happen with his just ability. He cuts in a lot. Um, Diaz is definitely more dynamic, but if you're looking for something different, um, then I think Gakpo is your guy. Curtis Jones, Dominic Schoberslai, same debate. Uh, Curtis Jones is technically more gifted, but Dominic Schoberslai, just especially defensively, is an absolute monster. Just is the the leader of our press. Just covers so much ground, so that's a tough one. And then you have Jota over Nunez. Right now, Jota is a clear favorite, but Jota also drops these stinkers. Um, but the next game he'll usually bag one if he plays badly. So it's about balancing, you know, the difference between having Darwin Nunez off the bench versus versus Jota. Uh, Jota still deserves, it, in my opinion, the starting role uh, right now. But we'll have to see as the the season progresses. Um, also, just the last thing about Liverpool: um, Virgil, uh, Mo, and Trent are all in their last contract year. Haven't really mentioned it because I was expecting business to be done. It looks more and more dire as the days go on. Um, I'm pretty confident in Mohamed Salah staying just because he's chasing records here and it's probably in his best interest to stay. A little bit same with Verge, but when it comes to Trent, um, he's probably my favorite player and he's probably going to go to Madrid. This Jude Bellingham content right now is making me sad, upset, and I'm simply scared. So there's that. Um, Some other key games across the league. We mentioned how Brentford scored three times in a row in the first minute. Well, they didn't do the first minute, but they did the second minute. So, I mean, we're talking about the the best team in the first five minutes in history. I think it's got to be. I mean, four games in a row with a goal before the, the three minute mark is just incredible. They absolutely laid the wood against Wolves. And this Wolverhampton team, don't look now, they are bottom. Don't remember them being bottom. They've been results wise terrible. I feel like when they played Liverpool, they looked pretty good. But uh, I think uh, we might see the first domino fall with Gary O'Neill here, this international break. Wouldn't be surprised. I mean, their defense is so bad. 
It's so bad, dude. You sold like, Kilman. What'd you expect? I don't know. I don't know. But it's just they can't keep balls out of the back of their net. Um, yeah, Brentford, I don't know what they're like put into their energy drinks right before the game, but it's something real special. Uh, scoring in the second minute this game. Um, and Buemo gets a, gets another goal on a penalty. I mean, honestly, like they're kind of firing on all cylinders right now. I really like this Brentford team a lot. Yeah. And I, I think that they can finish in the top half, which would be a huge accomplishment already for, for Frank. Um, especially when you lose Tony, like the, the, the fact that they're able to get this much, much production, um, it says a lot, I think, about Frank and the mentality and the kind of culture he's building right now at Brentford. So that's a really good win for them and for Wolves. Uh, yeah, it's it's looking it's looking pretty dire. I don't know. Uh, I just don't know how they're gonna stop keeping the ball out of the back of the net. Like I, <laughs> they just have nothing back there. Like they play they played good against Liverpool, but even against Chelsea, they conceded six. So it's um, it's unfortunate. Uh, Gary O'Neill's job could be could be on the line here. Their attackers are great. It it is right the defense. I mean, Cunha's putting balls in the back of the net. They have Guedes, Wang, Larson, Larson. He's look good. Lamina, Forbes, the Ajax kid looks good. So yeah, no, I mean the Craig Dawson at thirty four, not gonna cut it. Mm-mm. And then Tati Gomes, who I don't even know. And this is without even saying that Ryan Aitnuri, he's gonna be gone. Very soon. He is a fantastic player. So their best defender is probably going to be bought in January. Um, so not feeling so good about Wolves. I do think they'll be able to save themselves from relegation if they go ahead and sack Gary O'Neill. But um, you never know. In terms of this Brentford team, they were dreadful last year. And it's because they made big signings and then kind of flopped. Well, now... You have Mikel Damsgaard finding his feet in the second year, looking a lot better, had two assists today. Um, Lewis Potter is looking is looking pretty good. And then, you know, Kevin Shade still eh, doesn't do it for me. But they, you know, these young signings that they made a year ago are starting to find their feet. And then you mix in a Vandenberg and Fabio Carvalho from Liverpool coming in with some experience. And I feel like that's been the difference. So I'm glad that Thomas Frank is is doing well, and uh, they're a fun side as they you know constantly. I feel like punch above their weight, even with some in- injuries to Vissa and a couple other you know star players. Um, West Ham finally won at home. Finally, finally got off the board. You know, I was thinking maybe Lopetegui would be the first domino to fall here to get fired. Uh, well, they beat the crap out of Ipswich, and it seems like his job is safe for now. I think. <laughs> I, think I mean, Mc- Mikel Antonio bagged one finally, so there's that. Um, and so that you know that front three or four looked deadly to start the season, and they finally you know put up some goals here. Ipswich are bad. Liam DeLapp keeps scoring bangers. Um, so I just wanted to mention that game as you know, we were expecting maybe Lopetegui to, to fall on his sword here shortly. I'm not that surprised. I think Ipswich had the really emotional, like, quality result against Villa last time out. Yeah. It's probably going to be tough for them to come back and put two really solid performances together, especially at West Ham, a team who needs wins. Like, uh, it felt like kind of a a tough spot for Ipswich, honestly. Um, yeah, and West Ham smacked them in the face right away, scoring in the first minute. So, I mean, it was it was uphill from there. Um, the lap is really encouraging for them, I think. That guy is scoring at will right now, at least in the last two games. Scores bangers. Yeah, like him a lot, Hoss. But a uh, big win for West Ham. I, I always kind of thought that it would be a little soon still for Lopetegui. I mean, he's, he's still getting adjusted, I think, to all these players, but they obviously do have higher expectations this year with the kind of signings that they made. Um, I think it's encouraging also that Kudus scored. Um, so sorry. He's, so, he's so talented, and I feel like sometimes he gets lost in that team a little bit just because um, even though he is arguably the most skillful player besides Paqueta on their team, I think that sometimes, like, their lack of finishing sometimes at top up top um, 
makes him not look as good as he actually is. I think he's an absolute baller. So him getting on the board, I think, also is a really good sign for West Ham. And we'll see if they're able to find some sort of consistency. Absolutely. Um, probably the the biggest result of the weekend, Brighton, Hove Albion, beating Spurs, coming back from a 2-0, um, down 2-0, and they score three goals in the second half. I mean, if you're if you're Spurs, man, most Spurs you result ever. You're up 2-0, Johnson, Madison, the boys are buzzing, and then you just completely lose your head in the second half, just unacceptable. I And didn't even know what to say after the game. And you have Brighton that are sixth and, and Tottenham that are ninth. Just not a good start. We'll see if they can kind of flush the bad result out of them during the international break. But it feels like two steps forward, one step back for the Spurs team like usual. Again, I don't think like the performances are that bad though. Like it's like they're not even playing. I don't think that poorly. It's just the way that they're kind of set up with their high line. It's possible that they're going to concede goals, and that's what's been happening recently. Um, like you mentioned, they had a great first half, and they were exposing Brighton. But also, you know, Tottenham doesn't necessarily play as aggressive of that of a line, but it's still pretty high, and Brighton's able to expose them right back, and there was a flurry for like seven minutes and Brighton scores three and all of a sudden the game's been flipped on its head. Um, I want to give my credit to my shout out to Danny Welbeck because uh, the guy is completely, you could argue Danny Welbeck right now with Brighton is playing the best football of his career. And it's kind of insane. I mean, the guy at, at Man U, he was more, he was young. He was learning from everybody there, but now he's established and he's been riddled with injuries in the past. He's getting his chance now again at Brighton, and he's showing out. Um, and really, since he's been at Brighton, I think he's been very consistent for them. Um, so having him up top, Matoma put in a really good performance as well. Once he is a real threat for them, I think that Brighton are even more dangerous with how high they press. He's able to create stuff. I like Brighton a lot. It's just a matter of if they're able to keep the ball also out of the back of their own net and if they don't shoot themselves in the foot. Yeah, Ruter, two goals in two games now. He's getting hot, the signing from Leeds. Always been a big fan of Ruter, so glad to see he's kind of hit the ground running. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, and I just don't know if this is like a Premier League sustainable style of play. I think that everyone has to evolve. I, I saw Jurgen Klopp evolve. I've seen Pep Guardiola evolve. I've seen Mikel Arteta evolve. And, and all three of these coaches that I named have evolved to try to challenge. And I just don't know, even with the talent that Spurs have accumulated, I just don't see I, they have to make some sort of adjustment, in my opinion. So, you know, disappointing. I also saw that Welbeck, like, is now, like, has outscored, like, some absolute legends in the print in terms of Premier League all-time goal scorer. And it's just hilarious. He has been playing, and he's strictly played in the Premier League the entire his entire career too. So I guess that kind of makes up for it. But it was there was some good banter online. He's seasoned. Now you have Aston Villa tie United. This was a really boring game, so I don't really want to talk about it that much. But I just wanted to ask you: Was that result enough to keep Ten Hag's job? Because I think it's literally a coin flip. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in the same boat. If this is worst, the time to do it. It's their worst it Premier League start. Is it ever? It might be. I think it's ever. Their worst Premier League start ever. 14th. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think his job's on a nice edge right now, honestly. Like, I think that – I think this result, while it's Manchester United and you expect them with the kind of talent and the name itself to take care of Aston Villa just – if you're looking from the outside, I think that this result might have bought him a little more time, at least past this break, I think. But it's still uh, it's still completely up in the air. I think that also, like, they probably have the feeling that they don't want to make a coaching change, a coaching change, just because they had 
the courage to even stand with him this off season. You don't want to necessarily make a, make a move in the middle of the year and change th- things completely up. But I think at this point, I think you need change. Um, I don't know. It's kind of stubborn. Like, Look at the Browns still starting Deshaun Watson when they fucking suck. Like I, it's the same thing. I think you're just like, you're doing the same thing over and over again with nothing completely changing. Um, I would love to see Van Nistelrooy get an opportunity to, to manage it, like himself as his first gig. I know it's like a lot of pressure, but I don't know. Throw him in there. If you look at Tuchel, he's always a good option. I think there's options out there for them, but I still think that they still don't know what they're going to do. Thomas Tuchel needs to be the Manchester United coach. I mean, if Rashford is mouthing he's gone mad after getting subbed, I can't imagine what he's going to say when Thomas Tuchel becomes the Manchester (laughs) United coach. That's going to be amazing. Yeah, I mean, Ten Hag, you're a terrible coach. You have benched, you know, the most expensive signings that you've signed the last three years. Is he a better coach than Shulshar was? No. No, I don't think so. Solskjaer finished third one season. Mm-hmm. I guess you could, I don't think Solskjaer won silverware. And of course, Ten Hag did. So I guess if you're talking trophies, but. I mean, if you're talking situation, Manchester United beat a hungover Manchester City team who just completed the treble. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if they were the most motivated they could possibly be to win that FA Cup. Um, I also don't think the FA Cup means as much as it used to. That's either. probably true. So definitely true, actually. I'll, I'll say definitely true. So I don't know. You also had the worst UCL campaign of like all time last year and your Europa one is not off to a hot start here either. So Mm -hmm. plus every single player you're playing hates the coach. Somehow Anana still has the clean sheets. That's literally the only good statistic. He's been good. Actually he's been good, Um, but they're not scoring goals. Their captain is getting red cards now consistently and you're starting Johnny Evans and Harry Maguire in 2024. And really, that's, that, that's crazy to me. You bench both your starting center backs. Yeah, that that is wild to me that it's come to that. But also, like, I guess you're looking for something. If he didn't have the emergence of Kobe Mainu, he probably would have been long gone. I think that hit, bought him a job and some good results against City and Liverpool, but I think when you're on the international break and you have two weeks to kind of let the dust settle, I think go ahead and you've been waiting for this moment. You'll see how Van Nistelrooy does. And then from there, you you kind of start lining up a Potter or a Tuchel or, or someone like that to see if they can kind of make a difference. So we'll have to see. Um, Everton, another Everton tracker here. They want or they tied. So against Newcastle, felt pretty good about that one. Um, and then your team – Ties against Forest. I, I tried to let the listeners know I had a good feeling about Forest here. It's not a bad result because Forest are actually pretty cracked this year. They're they're tenth right now, so tough team to beat. But top four is Liverpool, City, Arsenal, and Chelsea. Um, Liverpool with one point lead, no big deal. I was posing the question: Do you think this this top four? Do we have our top four teams? Not in a particular order. But do we have our top four teams? Yes, I think so. I, agree. I don't think it's not, order. it's not. It's not going to be in that order. I don't think, unfortunately, for Liverpool. But um, I, I, I do think that that is the top four. I, I don't. Before the year, I think I said Newcastle would be in the top four. Uh, I haven't been. I haven't really been that confident watching Newcastle at all this year. No. And I know Isak's out, but um, they don't give me any hope really at all. Um, yeah. And Brighton, like they're in six right now. I I can't see them managing to – Too keep, inconsistent. Keep the ball out of their net enough. Yeah. I, think, I just think they're going to be playing in too many of these, you know, crazy – track games where it's like you don't even know what's going to happen so maybe the funnest team to watch in the prem though 
I mean, dude, Brighton Tottenham this weekend, like that's a game on crack. Like I know, I know first half of Chelsea and Brighton was maybe actual crack, but Brighton Tottenham back and forth, two teams who love to attack. Like that's as a fan, like that's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to agree. I mean, I just didn't expect Chelsea to be this functional. I guess is the best word. Even Mareska um, said, I think in his presser, because they were asking him, like, how do you feel about going to the next over the, moon. the international break and you're in top four? He's like, we don't really think about that. But if you asked me before the year, I mean, I don't know. happy. I think he was like, I think he wanted to say, like, honestly, no, probably because we played horrible in the preseason, but like, it's a brand new team. You got to implement a lot of stuff and it usually doesn't kick in until later. Like, I, I've been super impressed with Chelsea. And Cole Palmer, I mean, Ooh. he had a touch today, the first touch around Dude. the guy outside the foot, and it, it wasn't a goal. Double save. But it was the, one of the most magical first touches I've seen in a very long time. I mean, it it made me feel a certain type of way. Let's just say that. So Nasty. Uh, it, yeah, I'm I'm liking this Chelsea. If Cole Palmer gets injured, you guys are in a hell of a lot of trouble. But if Cole Palmer, which is great that you're doing load management for him and not doing the Europa Conference League, you know, if he stays healthy, yeah, you guys top four are locked up. I just don't think Villa has the depth to keep, you know, punching above their weight. So that's I wanted to, you know, kind of end the conversation there. But I, I do agree with you. This is kind of the top four through week seven. I just don't see maybe Brighton or Villa could creep up there, but over, you know, a long season, 36 games, I believe it is. Um, I, these are, these are the four that I feel pretty confident in staying there. Um, Bundesliga. Absolute <laughs> fantastic game here. Bayern Munich tie Eintracht Frankfurt. Another underdog that I try to give out. Oscar. Is it Oscar Marmouche? It's it's something with an O. Oliver, but I think. Omar, Omar. 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 We neither of us. Neither of us. Just. Omar Marmouche just literally just carried his team to a draw. This guy, six matches, eight goals, four assists. He had two goals and an assist in this game alone. Mm-hmm. Byron's defense had no clue how to how to fend. And you know, they probably felt bad that they were just giving this guy open grass because they both Upa Makano and Min J Kim scored off two respectable corners. But this game was, this game was absolutely bonkers. Everything I pointed out about Bayern kind of was shown in this match where they're really good for going forward, still really suspect defensively. Um, but honestly, I thought Bayern completely threw away these three points here and Eintracht Frankfurt should be, should feel pretty happy here. And, if I'm company, I'm I'm pretty pissed off. Yeah, I think any time that you get a result against Bayern, you're happy. Um, yeah, I think Bayern, you know, Marmouche scores the late goal to, to tie the game, and that place kind of just went crazy. Uh, Frankfurt's had a really, really good start to the year. Um, I'm encouraged a lot by them. I think Marmouche and Ekatike going forward make them so dangerous. Like, aren't they – they're second right now, I believe. Yeah. Um, I also just found they're third, actually. Third. Somehow Leipzig second. I've been calling for Rose's head in their second. <laughs> I, I don't know how that's possible. And they did beat Leverkusen on the road. I guess they did. Do, I, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, don't think they're listening to your to your takes on their coach. No, they're not. They're probably very happy with Marco, but I'm not. <laughs> um just found something out on the spot that you mentioned. Yeah, they are third in Bundesliga right now. Dino Topmuller is their coach. Do you know where he was before this? I don't. Bayern Munich assistant coach. Mm, this game meant a little more to him, I would say. He knew exactly where to po- poke the holes in, in that mm. Bayern defense. That's what I'm going to say. Very impressed because – you know, replacing Glasner and, and Frankfurt have been good, but I mean, this, this is a really young team. I mean, these guys, a lot of these guys are, you know, wonder kids or, or guys that you don't have many 
you know, veterans in this team and, no. and to go and to face you know, a pretty strong Byron side, that's, that's really impressive. So you know, credit to them. It was a fantastic game. Definitely watch the highlights if you missed it. Um, but, you know, I, how do we I, not have this? Oh, how do we not have that over on the sheet? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know how I missed <laughs> that one. I don't know how I missed that one. Um, but you know why I think Bayern should be really pissed because probably and arguably their challenger, Bayer Leverkusen, absolutely threw points away no against problem. one of against one of the worst teams in the no entire problem. Bundesliga, Holstein Kiel. You're up two nil and you throw away a two nil lead, and you have plenty of opportunities to 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 go ahead and just bad defending. It was just. It was just bad. And it was a goal from a penalty in a corner just out of nowhere, too. Like, it wasn't just like, you know, Kiel started to play their way into the match. They just smash and grab. I just cannot believe we didn't see an extra time goal here for Bayer Leverkusen. Maybe the most stunning result we'll see all year. Not yeah. even kidding. I thought this game was going to be 8 0 after 10 minutes. It was 2 0. I was 2 0 nil, two nil Leverkusen, I think, after 10. It was. And I thought this game. I thought they would have to implement the high school mercy rule. Not yeah. Like I, I thought that it was going to get that, get really out of hand. And I could not believe my eyes when the final whistle blew and it was two, two. I, yeah. I was, I was dumbfounded. Um, Byron had, or Leverkusen had the ball the entire game. They don't lose at home either. Literally Keel had. Unstoppable at home. Yeah. And Keel, Keel could have taken the lead late in the second half. The yep. Leverkusen's goalie made a hell of a save on a cross. Um, for a header that was bound for to go in. So really just, I'm just puzzled uh, by the result. Honestly, I couldn't really believe what I was watching. Um, I guess shout out to Keel uh, and for Leverkusen, like just can't happen. Just can't happen at all. Nope. Nope. Can't happen by nope. or, I, I mentioned Leipzig earlier that they get back to winning ways with an absolute gritty win against Heidenheim. Really surprised they honestly got three points out of that, um, to be honest. Openda with a – You hate a, Leipzig. I do. I'm not <laughs> even going to hide my bias They're here. on the hate list. They are. They already are on the hate list. And then, you know, we might have to add Dortmund on this one. They lose to Union Berlin. Dortmund might be bigger frauds than, than Leipzig. It's – I mean, I, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give Sahin some time here. They were also, you know, they just got injured with Adiyami, um, so that that obviously hurts. But other than that, you're basically fully healthy. Can't be losing to Union Berlin. Uh, just, I mean, Union Berlin's doing well this season. I don't know how they're doing well after they should have gotten relegated last year. They're they're in sixth place right now. So props to them, but. Yeah, that's just not a good result. They should have lost to Bochum a week bef- a week before, and they blew out a really bad Celtic team to make it all okay. So, um, wanted to mention that result. Now going to the the La Liga, Barca just nothing really new there. Just they blow the, uh, Alaves out of the water three 0 at halftime. No goal scored in the second half. Just kind of cruising to victory. Their captain Rafinha. Just his. Balling. You could argue he's playing better than Lewandowski, and Lewandowski is his top goal scorer in in the entire La Liga. Rafinha has five goals and four assists and nine apps. Lewandowski at age thirty six, ten goals and two assists in nine. So just cracked. Lamine them all somehow. They just keep trying him out there to play. Getting kind of concerned about the amount of game time he's getting, but <laughs> he's, young, he's young. He's young. He's young, but we see we've seen Gavi back in training, um, which is you know we'll probably see him after the international break, which is good. Fati's making his way back in as a sub. We'll see if forget. I just forget about him, man. Uh, we'll see if he can get Dude. anywhere near back to his best. I mean, that guy was a stud. He was he was Lamal before Lamal was Lamal, and. You got some interesting young. I like. I really like this Paul Victor kid who's 22 years old. So we'll see. But you know they're they're you know pretty comfortably um, ahead here because Atletico Madrid throw away three points with an absolute wonder goal from Lucas Usic, just an 
a Puskas contender here. Um, so Atletico continue to be one of the weirder teams, um, the handicap, and then Real Madrid. This could have been, you know, a line in the sand game for them. I had a bad feeling about it. You were pretty confident they'd bounce back. They did bounce back 2-0 at home, thanks to a Vinicius absolute rocket for the second goal. But I expected a more uh, entertaining match here. I was pretty disappointed. Yeah, me too. I was a uh, over better. Um, but, you know, sometimes that's just how the cookie crumbles. And I can't necessarily say that um, we do have Villarreal on the love list. Uh, and I probably jinxed the entire game by saying that they haven't uh, missed an over yeah. at all this year. So good call. Hair will remember to uh, not say anything like that ever again. But, uh, yeah, Real, uh, I expected the bounce back and they got it. I mean, I... I've actually liked Villarreal a lot this to start this year. I think they've been really fun to watch. Um, Good chances too. They had chances. Yeah, I mean, and frankly, like you're gonna get chances when you play against Real Madrid. It's uh, it's something I wouldn't necessarily always say in the past, but they've been, just been so fraudulent defensively that it, um, they're gonna give teams uh, teams opportunities, and Villarreal didn't take them this game. And uh, guess who got hurt too? Just to make it worse. Yeah. No. Danny Carvajal, ACL. That was bad, dude. He, I actually felt like watching back that clip, like uh, my yeah. man, you could hear him outside the Bernabeu. Like that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he knew what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think everybody there knew was, what happened. <laughs> there was no walking that one off. Um, <laughs> he's I out mean, the area. He's getting up. He's out for the year. Yeah, he's he's getting up there in age too. So that might be the, one of the last times you see Danny Carvajal in in not only Real Madrid shirt, but I mean, what Lucas Vasquez backing him that's up? The, that's always been the replacement, hasn't it? Which is kind of crazy. Which I don't why, think so. Which is why Trent is probably going there next. That year. is that is true. My Lily, I have one hope here, Harry. One hope. They panic buy someone in January because they literally have to. Mm -hmm. And that guy ends up panning out where they don't need to spend. I guess he's a free agent, which would make it even worse for Trent, but they don't need to spend big money on Trent at that point. Yeah. I mean, I hope he resigns. They can find, I mean, <laughs> I know you do. I know you hope he resigns. Uh, I don't know. It just seems like the stars are aligning. Yeah. Pedro Porro there. You could get some good right back shots for, for that. Real Madrid January transfer. Maybe we sell them in, in January to, to at least get a profit here. I doubt that happens, but that's not really how Florentino Perez rolls. But wanted to mention that. So Real Madrid already fraud defensively, just got a lot more fraudulent defensively, in my opinion. Um, maybe you play Alfonso. No, he's on he's still on Bayern. Sorry. Um Audi was gonna go there. I did too. For Lemini. Fran Garcia, one of those guys on the right side. We'll we'll have to see. Um, not really sure how that's going to go. And then leading or closing off today's conversation with some Calcio, um, Fonseca uh, losing to Fiorentina. I think three wins, two draws, four losses out of the first seven or eight. Not good. Not um, good. And then you you name a penalty taker who happens to be the American captain, Pulisic. He takes none of the penalties. They miss both of them, Tammy Abraham and Teo Hernandez, and then they lose the game. Um, this was also one of the two games, first time I've ever seen this, two separate games on Sunday had three penalties taken in all all three were messes or saves. Insane. In this case, even more insane, the goalkeepers saved all three of these. De Gea with two, Magnan with one, all on frame. I don't know about the Athletic Club one, but they missed three. That game with Girona, that was bonkers as well. Got red cards, got everything. Both finished 2-1 with three penalty misses. You're not going to see that very often. So wanted to point that out. Hey, shout out Pulisic, he scored again. Good he goal. did gorgeous goal too. Yeah, I that mean, tech every goal right now is just kind of insane. I saw him and Abraham arguing over the second penalty. I mean, Abraham arguing with him. He knows he's the penalty taker. Yeah, not good. 
yeah, I don't know. It's a uh, right when I thought Milan was starting to put it together, they drop one. They yeah, dab De Gea. Yeah, not good. The the tech on on Pulisic's goal. I mean, that's just he made it look really easy. It is not easy. Yeah, it's not. It's not. He's just so he's in form. He's so he in is. form right now. He's buzzing. Uh, Roma. Ty Monza, so they might fire their coach again and then rehire De Rossi. I was seeing it on X. I don't think that happens, but <laughs> that club is just bonkers <laughs> right now. Um, and then Juventus, disgusting tie to to Calgary, while Napoli sit upon the top of the table um, because Inter Milan they did win, but they won three two to Torino. They're not. They're just not looking that good right now in Serie A. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but I will say Napoli looks so good. Scott McTominay, Lukaku, Kravacilia all look so good. And they are two points clear um, with a better goal differential than Inter, which makes me feel pretty comfortable where they're at just because Inter was obviously the most d- dominant defensive team in Serie A last year, and it seems like – you know, Conte came in there, signed one Italian center back, and said, "Hold my beer." Yeah, that's why he's the goat. Um, yeah. If you get a, if you get Lukaku in form, the guy is can be so lethal, man. I mean, he since he's gotten to Napoli, he's been fantastic. Um, you know, Conte's got him playing exactly the way he wants to, um, and really, when you put everything together, you have a motivated Napoli team with a coach who expects nothing less than to win every game. So, yeah. I mean, it's really the perfect recipe, I think, for them. Extra motivation for for Conte. He's won titles at both Inter and Juventus, and those are going to be the two teams more than likely that are going to challenge him. Yep. And I don't think he has bad blood with either club, but I wouldn't say when he leaves he goes out on good terms. No, probably not. It's the X that you see that you're like, Oh, I really don't want to say hi to her, but you keep it civil, you know. Right, right. So we'll we'll have to see. Um, we'll have to see if that's even more motivation. But if there's any coach that's going to get the best out of Lukaku, it's Conte. Okay. The guy just works wonders with with Lukaku. I don't know how, but you know, I think that's going to be interesting. This top goal scorer race for for Serie A is going to be really interesting. I mean, Taram bagged a hat trick. Yeah. This uh this week, he leads with seven. Retegi with seven for Atalanta. Christian Pulisic with five. So Pulisic wearing the golden boot would actually be insane. It's not be- gonna it's not gonna happen. I'm gonna call it now. It's not gonna happen. But Christian Pulisic winning a golden boot in the Serie A would be insane. Nuno Tavares with five assists for Lazio as a left back is also something what I didn't have hell, on my. Dude? He's on crack apparently this year. I haven't watched much of Arsenal. Lazio, but I, I probably will not watch much of Lazio, but just interesting there. But that's all we have for today. Um, we are going to be back, you know, maybe next week for a nice fun episode and then a preview episode. Um, so let us know if you want to see any content. We're, we're starting to post more clips for our TikTok audience, for our YouTube audience. So definitely give us a like there or subscribe there. Um, it means a lot as, you know, we both had jobs. So this is just for fun. Um, but thank you again. Follow us on Twitter at Full Time Roundup. And we will see you next week.